everyone and welcome to the program. This is Sunday Politics live on Channel Television. I'm Sean sure Kimbalo in Lagos. There are two instances of attacks, one in Kaduna State and the other in Zamfara State. In Kaduna State, bandits have kidnapped the Emir of Kajuru, al Al Hassan Adamu, and 13 members of his family in an early morning attack in Kajuru, local government area of Kaduna State. It was reported that the bandits, numbering over 200, stomped the Emirates and started shooting sporadically before proceeding to the Emirates Palace, abducting 13 members of his family, including three women, two of his grandchildren, three of his eight, and five others. In Zamfara State, suspected bandits abducted the provost of College of Agriculture and Animal Science, Bakura LGA, Mr. Habibu Mensara, in the early hours of today in Zamfara. The elder brother of the provost, Nasiru Menasara, said the government attacked the provost residents of the quarters of the government science secondary school, Bakura, around 2 a.m. and abducted him. Some, some of uh, the security updates that we have for you. And now uh, we kick off our conversation tonight with the anticipation towards the passage of the Electoral Act Amendment B, which is hoped might be passed before the end of the new week, before lawmakers go on recess. There have been some doubts as the final, uh, on the final outcome of uh, the, the bill and worries as to gray areas and the clauses allegedly inserted. Many Nigerians have been speaking about these areas and the implications it will have on our electoral process. Areas like uh, electronic transmission of results, cost of campaign, and the issue of declaration of results under duress. These are some of the areas, about 20 of them, that um, some lawmakers are raising high eyebrows. The governors of the southern region of the country on Monday, when they met in Lagos, raised concern about these issues also. Take a listen to uh, the chair of uh, the Southern Governors Forum when they met in Lagos on the issue of Electoral Act Amendment. Well, we'll give you that in a moment, but let's uh, get to look at the issues uh, closer. I'm being joined on the program by a former INEC chairman, Professor Atahiru Jaga. He joins us from our Abuja studio. It's good to see you again, Prof, and thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Sharon, for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's begin the conversation. Considering how far we have come in our election history, how crucial is this very amendment of the Electoral Act? Well, uh, uh, Sheon, um, as you rightly know, um, there have been since 2010 significant uh, improvements and the uplifting of the bar in the conduct of elections in our country. Um, but uh, the bottom line is that a robust electoral legal framework is critical to election, election administration and to ensuring that elections are conducted with integrity. So it is absolutely necessary to periodically review the uh, Electoral Act in order to take into consideration uh, some of the observed flaws in the implementation of the laws uh, during the conduct of elections. And uh, since 2010, when there were significant amendments to the Electoral Act 2010, and we came to have the Electoral Act 2010 as amended, uh, there has not been, to my mind, any significant improvement in the electoral uh, uh, legal framework. So when the Ninth National Assembly commenced the process of amendment and the production of the uh, Electoral uh, Bill 2021, uh, many Nigerian stakeholders who wanted to see remarkable improvements in the electoral legal framework and uh, in the conduct of elections within that legal framework uh, have uh, been very happy and have participated very actively uh, in that uh, process. So it is necessary to periodically review 
the electoral legal framework. It has been long overdue, and uh, I think that uh, it is good that at long last there has been uh, an effort which is almost concluded to review the uh, Electoral Act 2010 as amended. It is that process that is giving some Nigerians some worries uh, as to the work being done and perhaps some areas, well, some lawmakers who are in fact part of the process are now alleging that there are some insertions. Uh, there are obvious fears about the Electoral Act Amendment, especially the electronic transmission of results, which earlier in the week on the program, the Senate Committee Chairman explained that uh, the reasons why the electronic transmission of results may not be feasible just yet due to internet penetration and some other logistics and technical issues. Should the electronic transmission be excluded in this amendment or disabled, any major implications for our future elections? Well, uh, uh, Sharon, as we all know, uh, in most electoral jurisdictions uh, in the world, efforts are being made to introduce technology uh, in order to improve the integrity of elections. Um, uh, I think when one looks at the draft of the electoral uh, 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 bill currently in circulation, uh, which the National Assembly hopes to uh, pass before they go on recess, with regards to uh, um, utilization of technology, there is a very, very contradictory provision in there. While they permitted INEC to use uh, uh, electronic voting, they now said INEC uh, provided that INEC does not use electronic transmission of results. And it's, it's really uh, uh, counterproductive. You can't permit INEC on the one hand to, transmit, uh, to use electronic voting and not to use electronic transmission of results because usually they go as a package. But besides that, uh, most countries are really using it as the best practice because electronic transmission of results, once there is a robust software and the hardware for doing so, it now brings efficiency it brings transparency and uh, real-time uh, ability to, to see the results as they are transmitted from the polling units uh, to a national coalition center. You know, so it's good practice and uh, it's upscaling of uh, 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 the use of technology to improve the integrity of the electoral process. So frankly, denying INEC uh, that uh, opportunity of deploying electronic transmission of result uh, would uh, be very counterproductive. In fact, would uh, undermine uh, the integrity of future elections. We all know how the human agency, the interference uh, uh, in the collation of results uh, 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 or in the declaration of results is being affected by that human agency, whether it is um, uh, 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 holding uh, uh, returning officers uh, 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 under duress uh, or uh, through bribery and intimidation and other things. Electronic transmission of results will ensure that uh, the traditional fraudulent activity of changing results from the polling unit to the coalition center would now be things of the past. So it's very, very important that our legislators recognize this and recognize how important it is. You know, it's useless, in my view, to say you can do ele uh, uh, electronic voting and then to say you can't transmit results electronically. That's a clear contradiction. In any case, many countries usually begin with electronic transmission of results uh, before they even come to start using electronic voting. Again, I know for a fact that since around 2012, 2013, uh, INEC has been uh, uh, piloting electronic transmission of results uh, in order to, when, once they get the legal framework, to begin to launch it. And uh, as we saw in uh, some of the off-season elections, 
uh, they already have a very robust uh, uh, and a very uh, real-time transparent process of transmitting results. All they needed to do perhaps is to pay attention to uh, 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 cyber security that can guard against uh, uh, infiltration or uh, hacking uh, of this. And there are already very good softwares out there uh, that, that uh, 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 prevent uh, hackers from tampering with results as they are transmitted uh, along the line. So I think uh, um, uh, we expect the National Assembly to bring about reform measures that will improve the integrity of elections and uh, frankly, uh, not permitting transmission, electronic transmissions of results would even create an impression that uh, the uh, legislators are afraid or are unconcerned about the integrity of the process of transmission of results. Because there are many irregularities in our electoral process related to the ma uh, uh, manual or uh, 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 yes, manual uh, or analog, if you wish, uh, transmission of results in our elections. Uh, for someone who has managed Nigeria elections, so many of it, off-season, season elections, um, I know that uh, INEC, uh, Inedo and Ondo experimented with the electronic portal where results were uh, dumped and people can uh, track the results real time and see what is happening. How many of these results mm. have come in, although not legally backed at the time when these were used, but people can mm. see some level of transparency in that process. But a lot of Nigerians know that most of the manipulation that we see in elections happen in the transmission of the result, not even during the voting process. Is it the politicians being jittery because politicians a lot of the times do not want a situation where they cannot be in control of certain areas uh, like uh, a popular saying that uh, politicians don't actually want everything to be too transparent for, for them. It's not comfortable to them. That's uh, some of the popular saying during elections. Uh, is, is it the politicians being uncomfortable now in what we're seeing in uh, them wanting a situation where we will not have a tra uh, an electronic transmission of results. Uh, yes, uh, Sheun, definitely there are some of those concerns. Uh, not all politicians are fraudulent and crooked and want to win by hook or by crook, but it definitely is a tendency in our country. Some politicians want to win by using every means necessary. And uh, one clear area where they have been doing this and uh, regrettably very successfully is in the changing of results as they are uh, moved from the polling units to the coalition uh, centers. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, the pilot that INEC did in some of these off-season elections shows clearly that we are headed towards a more transparent and a more efficient uh, 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 processing and transmission of results. Because uh, again, use of uh, electronic transmission of results will also uh, minimize the time it takes for final results to be declared. And uh, there is uh, a, 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 a clear trail uh, in terms of interrogating uh, uh, the results electronically uh, 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 in case there are doubts about uh, the efficacy uh, 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 or the legitimacy of some of these results. So frankly, I think honest politicians in the National Assembly who want to see uh, improvement in the integrity of our electoral process uh, should not pander to the wishes of the crooked ones uh, uh, and should therefore ensure that this uh, uh, Electoral Bill 2021 is appropriately amended before it is passed uh, to introduce this very significant uh, required uh, improvement in the electoral process. Um, so uh, the, the flip side to this, Prof, is technically speaking, is Nigeria, is Nigeria ready for an electoral process that is fully digitized or electronic? 
Well, if you mean fully digitized by saying electronic uh, voting, for example, um, I will urge that we make haste slowly. There is no doubt that if electronic voting can be done properly and appropriately, uh, it, it, it really will go a long way in improving the, uh, uh, the integrity uh, and the credibility uh, of our elections. You know, but there are so many challenges in our country. For one thing, to be able to do uh, uh, effective, thorough uh, uh, electronic voting, uh, you need the infrastructure, you need the software, but you also need associated support infrastructure. For example, stability of electricity, extensive uh, 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 network uh, uh, coverage, uh, and uh, uh, robust uh, uh, and reliable internet uh, facilities and accessibility. Um, in, in Nigeria, many of our polling units are either in areas where there is no uh, stable electricity, if there is at all, or where there is no uh, uh, effective uh, internet uh, 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 network. So I think to that extent, we have to make haste slowly uh, in the sense that once INEC is given the power, legal power, to deploy uh, 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 electronic voting, then they can start, first of all, by looking at all the available technologies electronic voting technologies and find the ones that are most adaptable and suitable to our circumstances. This is something INEC could have done a long time ago, if not for the legal impediment, which said that there should be, there shall be no electronic uh, voting. But now that the uh, 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 electoral amendment uh, in the new bill uh, would permit electronic voting. It gives INEC the opportunity, first of all, to look for a very adaptable and a suitable and robust electronic voting technology that can suit our own purposes. And then they can also look at the possibilities of if electronic voting should commence, where should it commence, how should it commence, uh, in what time frame. So, so I think removing that legal impediment and allowing INEC to use uh, electronic voting gives it the scope to now to begin to look at how to do this. And I think that is a good development. Where there is a problem is where now the same uh, legal uh, section provision that gives INEC to deploy electronic voting is also denying INEC the power to do electronic transmission. It's very, very contradictory. In fact, it will even undermine uh, electronic voting uh, if and when it becomes the time uh, to do it. And uh, in any case, in our own country, uh, it looks like the priority now, having all the other things that have been done to add credibility to our elections, the next, things, next stage is to begin electronic transmission of result and to perfect it before we can also begin uh, electronic voting. So it's good for us to look in the direction of electronic voting and for INEC to begin to plan for it. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, I, I think uh, once INEC has that opportunity and legal power, then the issue of when it can be introduced or how it can be introduced. For example, it can be introduced in phases. Many countries have done that. The cities we know have more stable electricity. They have more stable uh, 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 internet connectivity uh, and other things. You know, so you can begin to say that maybe the ma in the major cities where also there is a large concentration of voters, we can begin to pilot electronic voting in those places. But that piloting of electronic voting has to be uh, together with electronic transmission of results. Otherwise, it's nonsense. It's useless, uh, in my view, uh, uh, to do that. You can't even do electronic voting 
devoid of electronic uh, transmission uh, uh, of result. You know, so we should make haste slowly, but we should be focused and be determined to increasingly, systematically, uh, and more robustly use technology in our electoral process. I, I would like to get your view because we're looking at um, uh, the issue of how effective our elections can be, and that also has to do also with the integrity of those who are managing it. Uh, one area is the nomination of uh, the president's aide, uh, Loretta Onoche, and which has caused a lot of controversy. I'd like you to listen, Prof, to um, some of the uh, response the woman gave when she was um, uh, responding to the lawmakers, Ms. Loretta Onoche. Take a listen to part of our response uh, at uh, the Senate screening process, and I'd like to get your view on whether or not uh, the nomination should go through, or in this climb, what should we be expecting? Take a listen to Ms. Loretta Onoche. Mrs. May Abamuchembo is from Delta State, but she was nominated, she's married to somebody from Cross River State, and she was nominated to represent Cross River State, not Delta State. Are you a current member of any political party, madam? Since 2019, when President Muhammad Buhari won his second term, I have removed myself from anything political, not even anticipating that I will be here today defending uh, my nomination to INEC. It was never in my, I never, never envisaged it, but here I am. Since 2019, I have not had anything to do with any political organization in this country. Even Buhari support organizations, I have not had anything to do with them since 2019. So when APC decided to do a proper registration of their members and to revalidate their membership, I did not take part in that exercise. So as I'm sitting down here, I am not a member of any political party in this country. You swore to an oath, an affidavit, rather, in the High Court of the Federal Capital Territory. I don't know whether it is. I would want you to take a look at this document and confirm whether it is your own or not. In paragraph three of that affidavit, it said that I am also engaged in active politics and a member of the Neighborhood Watch and has also contested the local government elections under the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom. I am also a member of the All Progressives Congress and a volunteer at the Buhari Support Organization. There is nothing wrong I can see in the appointment of Madam as INEC National Commissioner. All the points, according to the petitions I read, most of them are sentiments. Madam Onoche, the place on oath to repeat what she said as to whether or not she's a member of a political party. If we only put somebody on oath in a committee, if we were having it, if, if, if there was uh, there, there was an investigation, we are not investigating. This is not an investigative hearing. Prof, you heard uh, that b the back and forth and the response from Ms. Loretta Onoche. The, the, the question is that of morality and legal also. In this climb, what's your view on this situation? Um, you see, uh, Sheon, our electoral legal framework, particularly the constitutional provision on INEC, uh, anticipates that both the chairman and the national commissioners um, uh, would be people who are nonpartisan, who are not card-carrying members uh, of a political party, uh, but who can show, uh, uh, um, I mean, from whose previous uh, uh, social and political uh, lives, it will be clear that they have not been uh, outrightly partisan in the sense of working for a political party or supporting 
uh, uh, actively a political party. You know, I think that is the spirit of, of that legal constitutional uh, uh, provision. You know, so this, this kind of controversy is really avoidable. You know, any person who generated uh, such a controversy, uh, actually the appointing authorities should uh, be careful. You know, because you don't want to appoint anybody uh, uh, that can raise suspicions or doubts or can uh, lead to a loss of trust uh, of the electoral uh, management body. You know, so, so frankly, I, I think, uh, and uh, uh, I'm sorry to say that from some of the documents that I have been privileged to see, uh, both about her British uh, citizenship and also her, her belonging uh, and a very, very active participation uh, uh, in, the, uh, in a political party up until 2019, if we are to believe that she had disengaged after the 2019 election, you know, you, you will try to avoid appointing such people into an electoral commission because it can generate controversy, because it is likely that any election that she supervises uh, and where the party that um, uh, she had belonged to, if she doesn't belong to it anymore, uh, will still uh, generate controversy. You know, to, to be honest, uh, this is avoidable and um, uh, the National Assembly need to really look at the spirit and the letter of the constitutional provision and the moral issues or ethical issues associated with these kinds of appointments, not just this particular one. And uh, in fact, uh, to be honest, the, the president can also just withdraw that nomination. After all, there are so many hundreds, I will say, of women with credibility, with capacity, with competence in both Delta and uh, across River States. So why bring somebody that can generate controversy in this regard and raise suspicions about even the intention All right. uh, of the appointment? Okay. So, so, I, so I think that we should put this controversy behind us and uh, 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 do the right thing. I'd like us to uh, get to our concluding moment with you, Prof, but we need to take a break. And uh, I'd like to get your view on what has become uh, the increment of uh, the campaign expenses for presidential campaign. It has been increased up from 5 billion naira. Does that make sense? I'd like to get your view uh, after this break. And up next on the program, we switch gears and my get two guests that will be joining us after now will be talking about the 2023 zoning debate and what the Southern Governor said in Lagos. Don't go anywhere. I'll conclude the moment also with Professor Atai Rujega. Everyone for staying with us. The issue of Electoral Act Amendment is what gets us talking. And the former chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Professor Atai Rujega, is our guest from our Abuja studio and our concluding moments with Prof now. Prof, there are one or two areas I'd like you to quickly help us uh, touch on before we uh, conclude with you. You've heard about the plans to raise the campaign costs or expenses of a presidential campaign up from 5 billion naira. What's your view on that? I think, uh, Sheon, in my view, is a very dangerous provision in the, this uh, Electoral Bill 2021 that is in circulation. You know, since the commencement of the Fourth Republic, uh, there have been concerns about the use of money in politics, you know, about how parties, first of all, mobilize resources, and uh, how they deploy these resources uh, into electoral uh, contests, you know. And uh, simply, well, I think the major argument that people use to review the, elect the uh, campaign financing thresholds and limits was to say that uh, uh, the provisions in the Electoral Act 20, and, uh, 2010 as amended uh, were outdated, you know, because of inflation and other things. Even if uh, um, uh, we accept that without conceding, uh, the fact of the matter is, is, is that you can't do 
27 uh, fold increment, 27 fold increment, and so on and so forth, as is clear uh, in the table that uh, is in circulation. You know, how can you improve from 1 billion to 15 billion for presidential contest? Whoever is the candidate, why is he going to get 15 billion to deploy for campaign? You know, you, you know in fact, we are trying to not only monetize uh, elections, we are trying to exclude those who have no resources uh, uh, into electoral contest. In fact, we are trying to basically turn our democracy into plutocracy, which is basically governance by the wealthy. And I, I don't think a democracy, uh, 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 that our transition to democracy should move at all in that direction. We must minimize and bring to the minimum the influence of money uh, uh, in politics. In fact, we should, uh, in fact, the direction of the amendment uh, regarding campaign financing should be penalties, rigorous measures of, of looking at breaches of uh, uh, use of money in politics and also penalizing those who uh, uh, use money extensively in politics. So I, I will urge very strongly, as uh, I feel as passionately about this provision as I feel about the issue of electronic transmission uh, uh, of results. So, so I, I think this is an area, this electoral bill uh, should not pass Senate until those issues uh, are carefully looked at. Professor Atairu Jaga, I wish I could ask you one or two more questions, but there are a lot of grants that we need to cover on the program. I have other guests on the program too. But it's a pleasure having you on the program and such an honor also to speaking with you and getting your views on some of these major matters of our electoral process. Thank you indeed, Professor Atairu Jaga. Thank you very much, Sharon, for this opportunity. All the best. Thank you, sir. So uh, let's switch gears now. A major part of the outcome of the over three hours of meeting of the Southern Governors on Monday in Lagos is the issue of zoning or rotation of presidency, especially that of 2023. Daniel Buala, a lawyer and a member of the Lincoln's Inn, joins us from our Abuja studio. And here in Lagos, Tokwe Fasua, an economist and a 2019 presidential candidate and the national chairman of ANRP is here with me in our Lagos studio. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for coming to join us tonight yes, to discuss this issue. Let's get started. And I'd like both of you to listen and hear what um, the chairman of the Southern Governors Forum said in Lagos on Monday in relation to 2023 and rotation. Take a listen to Governor Akiri Delu of Undo State. in order to consolidate our democracy and setting electoral process, the Southern Governors Forum rejects the removal of electronic transmission of election results from the Electoral Act and rejects the confirmation of exclusive jurisdiction in pre-election matters on the federal ICOF. Well, that is uh, the governor speaking about the Electoral Act, not the 2023 zoning. If my producer can just get us the one on the zoning so that my guests can take a listen to that and react to it. All right, we get to it in a moment. I'm, I'm being told that they will get that to us. But let me get the view of Mr. Daniel Buala to get the conversation started for us. Mr. Buala. Give us a sense of what you make. 2023, the governors of the southern region of the country says, what is fair is fair. And fairness, according to them, is that 2023, the presidency should go to the south. Well, uh, thank you for having me. And uh, let, me, let me sort of predict before I then give you the premise. I predict that power will go to the south and most especially the South-South, given the trend of event and trajectories. But regarding the uh, position of the South-South governors, I think it is, uh, is grandstanding in my view because of the following reasons. Number one, 
from the legal standpoint, the every one of us, everyone knows that the constitution does not provide for zoning. And it is only when the constitution provides or any extant law provides for an item that elected officers can come together and begin to call on the president whose duty under Section 5 is to execute the provisions of the Constitution, to call on him to say you should zone. The president does not have the legal authority or the constitutional powers to zone the power anywhere in the country. That is premise number one. Number two, the idea that they are partisan on a common front in terms of a demand for power to go to the south is also suspect. Suspect in the sense that if you look at the Constitution of PDP, for instance, they provided for zoning. And the last time PDP had power, it was the South that was in power. And ordinarily, you would think that by now, without any conversation, the power should remain, should come to the North. The question there is whether if a Northerner competes for a post and fails to win, it means that his pa the power that was zoned will not move elsewhere. I do not think that is the intent of their constitution. However, the long the candidate from any political, uh, from any geopolitical or regional zone competes until the power moves to that before it can then move back. So even from the perspective of PDP, power should go to the north. Now from the APC, it's a good argument to say that power should go to the south because power has been in the north for six years and it's likely to stay for eight years. That is a good case. But it should be the APC governors that should then begin to converse that in APC as a party. More so, the chairman of Nigerian Governors Forum is an APC governor and is from the South. And this governor has leverage because he has a degree of influence control. The doors of the, presidents are, the president are open to him. Secondly, he has access to all the governors in the North. So instead of politicking, which is the requirement in political process, because even if the power is zoned to the south, for example, it cannot just go like that. There has to be some host trading. There has to be some negotiation. There has to be some politicking. It is a game of politics. So you cannot come together as a group and place a demand on somebody, one, who does not have the legal authority to zone the power. And if that ultimatum or that decree or whatever demand is to persons other than the president, then it is uncalled for to sit together in a meeting and then make that as a declaration. Now, just like in the case of uh, uh, ranching and grazing route, for example, they made demand for ranching, but it is also unnecessary because the entire governor's forum are at Edim that ranching is the best way. And you have also heard that good number of northern governors, in fact, governors of states in the north that you cannot be a president if you don't win, have lent their support for ranching. All you need is just to leverage on that kind of synergy and see how you can galvanize forces to then face the one person who does not believe in the ranching. But once you collapse yourself together in a region to begin to make a regional demand, even the governors you have in the, uh, in the north who are supportive and are sympathetic of your cause will begin to see that as a red flag and begin to then go back to their, uh, uh, their zone. And then at uh, the end of the day, you have the issue of ethnic championship instead of patriotism and citizenship in Nigeria. Mr. Fasua, uh, do you have a problem with the Southern Governors Forum's position? It does look like Mr. Abuala does not really agree that they can come together as a group in that regard. Well, I think um, they've stated their position. Of course, I do not believe it's a matter for the president, sitting president, to... Uh, adjudicate upon. Um, by every means, the sitting president shouldn't be determining who runs in 2023 or who doesn't. He should be out of the picture. Uh, by now, he should be what they call a lame duck president. All right. So politics should kick in. The parties should do what they need to do. Uh, like, like Daniel said, and I also agree that um, in APC, it'll be um, opposite to, to get someone from the South. You know, that's their internal politics. But uh, given that Buhari is likely going to be there for eight years and he's from the core north, okay, then they may want to take it down to the south and let somebody else have a shot. Then the issue will be, is it from southeast, south-south, or southwest, or wherever? They're going to have to deal with that. Uh, the whole idea of power shift and so on is, um, is, is their internal party politics, really. Uh, codified in PDP, not quite in APC, uh, because they've not had that much time to say they're shifting power around. So basically, this is how it's going to be. But let me also let you know, 
And no matter what they do, so long as there are more than two parties. Now, the first thing is that the PDP is waiting to see uh, for the APC to make the first move. If they go south, they probably want to bring someone from up north and then try to leverage on the number stuff. And the, no party wants to lose power. So it's always going to be like that. And then no matter what happens, you know, if these two uh, people put uh, their, 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 their flag bearers forward, I can assure you that people from everywhere in Nigeria will also come up in the other parties trying to get some power. Uh, over, over and above everything is that um, when you hear a lot of this noise about power shift and so on, if it was about making Nigeria better, then it's great. But oftentimes it's all about just getting the power for the sake of having the power. And that's where the problem is. I tell people, be careful what you wish for. Um, and also be careful the routes you, you pass to obtain power, because usually uh, people become victims of the same instruments that they deploy in getting power. Uh, we shouldn't be uh, still at this point, but we find ourselves at a point where we're still talking about tribal politics, regional politics, and all of that. And I'm not seeing very deep thinking in terms of how do we move this entity called Nigeria forward? How do we improve the lives of our people, no matter where they're from? And we're not even agreeing on some very core issues. I mean, we're still debating things like cattle rearing and so on. We're not even sure, we're not even agreed on taking 15 million children out of the streets, which is what the only thing that can guarantee any future for this country. We're not agreeing on the core issues of, of, of bridging the gap, the poverty gap in this country. We're not agreeing on, on things like, you know, where do the revenue and the taxes come from if, if, if the rich people in, of this country and the guys who have found themselves in all of these places are uh, willing to pay something back, some sort of elite consensus that would even guarantee their own enjoyment of their own. We're not agreeing on all of those things. And that's the problem. The, the issue of uh, political fairness has generated a lot of bickering and uh, largely created some artificial, if I may use that word, insecurity in the country where people are not satisfied, people are not happy with uh, what is going on and they are now bickering and they are agitated. In 2011, the major contenders, Nuhu Uribadu, Shekerao, um, Hamadou Buhari, Yeradua, all from the north. It mm. does look like all of the political parties, the major ones, agreed on where to go. In 1998, 1999, it does look like that agreement also went in that direction. Yeah. But let me allow you again to, I guess uh, we now have it, I've been told, uh, the governor of uh, Undo State on the issue of zoning, what they want uh, from the Southern Governor's foreign point of view. Take a listen to him. The Forum reiterates its commitment to the policies of equity, fairness, and unanimously agreed that the presidency of Nigeria be located between Southern and Northern Nigeria and resolve that the next president of Nigeria should emerge from the South. Well, you heard it there. Uh, so uh, if you're saying that uh, it, it does look like from your own permutations, uh, a political party might take advantage because uh, issues of natural causes happened in 2015 where the party did not envisage that the president was going to, a sitting president was going to die. Uh, should that happen? Would that uh, destabilize the political process? If what, should, if what should happen? If what you, the permutation that you brought on, no, it, that, it, 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 that it's, it's the PDP or the APC might just be weighing the options. They will always the, watch themselves and hedge themselves. And of course, everybody wants to grab this power back again and all of that. And of course, it's good when they are there. And what you'd ask yourself is, what have they done when PDP was there for 16 years? How far did we fare? When APC has been there for eight years or six getting on for eight years, how well have we done as a country? What are the indices? Everything is looking down south. Whether you're talking about unemployment or poverty or what have you, you know. So uh, that, that's the real concern. But I tell you, you know, this is real politic, and this is how it's going to play out. So uh, these gentlemen, they have said, look, they wanted to go to the south. You know, wishful thinking. But the point is, like, like I agree with Bwala that look, they should be talking to their party. Now, in 1999, we had a consensus of sorts as a result of the June 12 debacle. And for some reason, the AD and the, um, uh, and the PDP then, they managed to put forward two Southwest people 
all right? And we didn't have a choice. Um, the ideal situation that could have happened in 2023 would be for us to take this thing to the southeast, all right? Ideally. That's it. And, 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 and you know, listen, when I tell people, the only way I would, I would actually want to give the big parties some sort of redeeming feature is if they can show ownership of Nigeria itself. So, okay, like the small parties like ours were the registered and all of that, but these big parties in showing ownership of Nigeria should have been able to say, okay, uh, because of Nigeria, because of our people, because we want the next government to have some rest. You can see that these governments are coming now and none of them is resting. Jonathan did not rest. Buhari is not resting. You know, and people are going to see, people swear and all of that. And some of the agitations they are seeing are largely political. A lot of it is political, like he rightly said. You know, so if they could have said, okay, now we're going to the Southeast, so I'm going to put up two people. The issue then becomes who in the Southeast? Who is actually stepping forward? People have said, Peter B, we're not seeing him making that move. Kingsley Mogalu is making some moves, you know, but we would have wanted to see a ground swell. Unfortunately, even the Southeast itself capitulated to some extremist, uh, uh, you know, version of politics in, in leaving the space and to the rhetoric of, of, of secession and separation, which doesn't work. Bad politics. Because again, the secession cannot work. It can't even happen if it's going to happen. It's going to be a long, drawn out, painful, costly in terms of human life. Kind of thing, but you know? uh, so, I mean, I've so, had a so guess these, here, two, uh, these two uh, gentlemen, um, yeah. I've had a guest here who said to me, so you cannot blackmail the North to work with you. You have to speak with them, and I believe if, so. I think so. Agree, if so. they do have the numbers, well, as not far, obviously as, have as, the numbers. as per our, our, our population censuses and so on, do not have the numbers. I'll tell you what. I, I embedded with the North recently, you know, I was in the North for quite a while, interacting with people in Kano especially, and elsewhere, and even the people I've been interacting with in Abuja, most Northerners, even peasants, believe that it, this power should go to the South now. Even peasants in the North. So it's going to be pretty easy. And like Wala said, really, it is true that by the time you take this, you're coming from an extreme position, shouting down on them, cursing them, and saying all sorts of things, then they're going to put up their guards, and that is not how to build a country. Wasn't I put that, it to you. Wasn't what we are saying now the similar thing that happened pre-2011? Let me ask uh, Mr. Bwala. I mean, we saw the North galvanize. We saw the North say it must come to the North in 2011. So the question would be, what has changed? What is different from now when Southerners are saying it has to come to the South? When the North uh, insisted that power should come to the North in 2011, they did go. As a matter of fact, some of the lawyers that were then arguing that it was Jonathan's right to contest, and in fact, anybody's right, there is no zoning arrangement, and the rest. That same lawyers are the ones now saying the power should go to this uh, South. The same set of lawyers that in 2014, when the Confab Conference report was ready and they asked good luck President Jonathan to sign into law and he said he will not, people were challenging him to court. The same lawyer that defended him and asked him not to sign are the ones now asking for a new constitution. I know that there are political sides to this type of thing, but let me tell you something about our APC and especially governors from APC in the South. You see, the chairman of the uh, Governors Forum is from APC and is from the South. The chairman of APC in the Southwest is an APC and is from the South. They appear to be the ones that are leading the shout for the power to go to the South, even though, arguably, the highest number of infrastructure development in the administration of President Obari is in the Southwest. Now, when you begin to make that push, what you will do is that by the time you force this thing out of the support of the North, they will simply go to the South-South and support a candidate for the presidency. That is one part of the problem. The second one is that you will play into the hands of PDP. If you have noticed, whenever they sit in the South to talk about these things, PDP governors are their quiet setting trap. Why, what do I mean by that? If APC forced this idea of not waiting for the party to make a decision, forcing this idea of power should come to the South, power should come to the South, the minute it is released or supported grudgingly, if PDP fronts a candidate from the north, the APC members in the, AP, the, the, the northern elect electors you know, in APC will go in mass and vote for PDP. And then by 2023, PDP will snatch power from government. I will advise APC governors in the southwest to play the politics with wisdom because wisdom is profitable to direct. And without wisdom, 
there are multitude of struggle. That even if there is an agreement, because a lot of things that people are asking, uh, because the next conversation for me as a Nigerian is what President Buhari did when he signed the Not Too Young to Run bill. And he said, please, do not run against me, you young people. Let it be after I spend my eight years. I think that one of the conversations that is major is looking for young and vibrant Nigerians, no matter where they come from, to run for office in 2023. The question of zoning, where it zones to, will matter. Even if there is an agreement, because some people are waiting for President Buhari to say, I agree you should go to the South. Now, if he goes to the South, the question now is, where in the South? The South is, we say, they rightly deserve to produce a president. Is that not going to be another problem, Mr. Buhari? No, the way it works is that if the party now says the power is zoned to the South, it means that candidate from the South, irrespective of South, South, or Southwest, or, uh, or Southeast, when they go for the primaries, the North now will determine who amongst the candidates in the primaries they will support for the ticket. And that is why I'm telling you, like a prophetically from today, that a South-South candidate will emerge from APC as a presidential candidate. And regarding the youthfulness, you know, we are president saying, that's why we had program recently, the youth of APC, the progressives. And we say that since we construe the highest number of supporters, highest number of voters, highest number of volunteers, that the young generation of people in APC should begin to have their place of pride in elective position, not just supporters, but in prime place to stand for office. Now, as per who will come out of the primaries in APC, should the power be moved to the South, is something you can never predict. Not even somebody who is presently conceiving the idea. Because in politics, three minutes is like 30 years. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Fasua, uh, where do you see this going? Uh, because if you look at it, mathematically speaking, as I mean, I have my board and so I can break it down for people to understand. When you look at the voting population, the number, uh, the six states with the highest voting population, you have at least four of them in the north. Kano, Bauchi, uh, Kaduna. Uh, um, um, yeah, Kano, Kaduna, Bauchi. And you have uh, Rivers and Lagos joining the fray. So the question is that you need the North and you need to the buying of the North. From what uh, Daniel has said, what's your view on the, what could be a tendency that could cause another friction when it comes to the South? Well, the, of course, the issue will be for the South, where in the South, okay? Uh, he said South, South. I think it's, uh, Daniel is trying to dissemble you know, some sort of strategy and put some words around. Uh, because after Jonathan, why would it be South-South again? You know, that would be an issue. So the issue of if it was going to be in the South, is it South-South, Southwest, or Southeast? I said Southeast ideally, uh, but given the politics and how it's playing out and the isolationist politics I see coming from that region, which they are not even walking back yet, um, then it begins to look like the Southwest. Uh, may want to come. And then, again, so are we also, but I, I heard something very interesting here today. Are we asking that they zone it to the young people? If they're going to zone to the young people in any of the parties, I would expect that the young guys who are really uh, articulate and strong and can speak up and do stuff uh, should begin to move now. Look, it's, it's 2021. The elections is in, in February 2023. If Nigerians don't know your face, of course you can come from either of the two parties and rely on their structure. But still, it's, it's important for Nigerians to know who you are, to know your face, to know what you are capable of doing. Because before, before you know it, the time is gone. Uh, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, so that's the, it. the young people, they are very fast-paced. And absolutely. they're very agile. But, but you, when it comes to the politics, politics is not on Twitter. No, no, the politics but absolutely. Is on the I, ground. I, I agree with you. Absolutely. And, but when it comes to politics, young people have not shown that agility to come up with strategies. And it's I think from what you say, and you yeah. know, we did our best in 2019. It was a great time to do that. But young people must not get tired. In any of the big parties, the bottom line should be at the end of the day, taking this power and using it for Nigerians to get better, not just for yourself and for your ego trips and so on. Topper Faswa, it's good to see you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on today. Topper Faswa, an economics and the national chairman of NRP. And Daniel Boala from Abuja Studio, it's always a pleasure to have you, a lawyer and a member of the Lincoln scene. Thank you so much indeed, gentlemen, for your thoughts tonight. Cheers. Well, that's how we leave it. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I'm Sean Akimbalue. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.